Of course, I would like to introduce our speaker on behalf of Syracuse. Her name is Shri. She's the PhD uh, and Assistant Director for Graduate Recruitment at Syracuse. Shri, welcome. Thank you. Good to be back again with Dr. Lee, um, my first webinar this year. Always good to have you with us. Um, and of course, for those of you who are still joining, welcome once again. Um, so the focus of the event will be especially on the master's and the MBA programs, but feel free to ask all questions about the admission process, about student life. We'll be happy to take your questions as they come in at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, uh, Shri, if you'd like, we can start and we can take it from there. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So let me just start by sharing my screen real quick. Uh, make sure everything is okay. All right. Are you able to view my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so let me just make it a slideshow. All right, there we go. Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much again for joining this particular uh, webinar. For some people, it might be late in the evening, so I hope you're having a good evening. Um, I wanted to start off by sharing a little bit about Syracuse University. This is our beautiful building on campus, uh, the Hall of Languages, one of the iconic buildings at Syracuse University. It's a gorgeous campus, and this is a lovely fall day. Today, unfortunately, it is not so sunny. Uh, it has actually been snowing all morning, but it's a different kind of beauty uh, in the snow. So the university itself was founded in 1870. We are located in what's known as the region of upstate New York. Some people call it central New York. So in the state of New York, uh, located in the city of Syracuse, with an easy driving distance of New York City, about four and a half, five hours, I would say, and about two hours away from Niagara Falls. So Overall, at the university, we have 13 colleges in various disciplines, and Martin J. Whitman School of Management happens to be the business school at Syracuse University. We have a total of about 6,000 plus uh, full-time and part-time graduate students representing uh, over 100 countries and pretty much all 50 states of the U.S., this is the Whitman School of Management. It's the 16th collegiate school to be accredited by the AACSB, which is one of the major accrediting bodies for business schools. One of the things that I always like to point out to prospects interested in attending business school um, is to think about what type of class you would like to be a part of. Not all these schools are the same. Some are um, schools that in, you know, in, invite and interact with at least over a uh, thousand students because they have multiple cohorts and multiple specializations and it's a large class size. Uh, there are others which are mid-tier and then there are those like ours which are intimate sized programs. So for us, the unique selling proposition at Whitman is that we have small class sizes, which are combined with the resources of a large university. So you get the best of both worlds. And we like to have a very diverse uh, international multinational crowd in our classes among our faculty. Um, and also the resources provided by the university are along the same lines. So a little bit about the building itself. It's, you know, as you can see, pretty modern looking, uh, 22 classrooms. There are enough team rooms for graduate students to have their uh, team meetings because a lot of work that you will be doing in your program will be collaborative and team-based work, project work. So grades are assigned not just based on individual uh, effort, but also on a team effort. There are opportunities for you to use the meeting rooms also for uh, practicing mock interviews or for actual interviews that students use the rooms for when they are uh, getting their internship opportunities or discussions. You can use them. The, the building is smart enabled, so you can utilize your um, the Wi-Fi for your, you know, Skype meetings or your 
Microsoft Teams meetings, whichever platform you use. And it's, a, it's an overall student-focused environment that promotes lifelong learning. So sometimes students use the meeting rooms just to prepare for other exams like the CFA or the CPA. So there are different opportunities for which you can utilize the space for a lot of different learning uh, opportunities. And so I invite you to look at the website and learn more about what we are all about. I thought I could play this little video that tells you why Whitman and tell me if you're able to view this and As hear the sound, mobile, not I Ryan Reynolds, our new family plan with <laughs> but a member I'm gonna mute that. So let's skip the ad. And let's start that again. Syracuse, what do you picture? Basketball? Oh yeah. Snow? Sure, we definitely have that. But did you know that the internationally accredited Whitman School of Management is located right at the corner of one of the most bustling streets on Syracuse University's campus? Isn't it beautiful? But what goes on in there? Well, Whitman offers over 20 graduate level programs as well as certificates and executive programs. So it's totally up to me. With a massive support network and one-to-one -one career counseling and the campus-wide commitment to teamwork, you're not going through it alone. Our different graduate programs offer the flexibility to complete your degree on your time and on your schedule through a number of options. Our full-time and online MBA or master's programs give you hands-on practice, incredible immersive coursework, and our vast global alumni network. At Whitman, connected means much more than who you know. You'll harness the power of cross-disciplinary collaboration. There are a number of dual and joint degree programs you can take advantage of. Did you know that many of our students receive scholarships? Over 90% of full-time master's students receive scholarship funds. I know, I got one. Did you know that US News ranked Whitman's full-time MBA program number 57 in the nation? Wow, that's awesome. I'm so glad to be part of it. Whether you're on campus, enjoying the views and the food, or getting your degree online, you're set up for success. Just ask some of our students. There's so much that I've done thanks to Whitman. Everything from building out a robust professional network at the international level to immersive group projects that have taught me how to start or manage a business with my colleagues. Speaking of colleagues, I've made a lot of amazing- Wow, you sure do like it here, but we gotta keep this video going. We'll be right back. <laughs> Our graduates are working at places like Amazon Web Services, Ernst & Young, Merck, Grant Thornton, HP, Hood, KPMG, ProTVD Consulting, PWC, Young Brands, just to name a few. You'll also be joining a network of over 30,000 Whitman alumni. Let's just say our alumni network is supportive and growing. That's the power of Orange. With Whitman's experiential learning opportunities, you can get ahead of the competition and grab an internship. As a global business school, Whitman has a range of courses and projects that address important business issues around the globe. How about fund a business idea you've had since you were a kid? How does it feel to win the business competition? Pretty good. We pride ourselves on pursuing success together. So, whatever your dream is, you can do it at Whitman. One of the I almost forgot about you. Internship program where I apply things that I learned in the classroom to real-world problems. You also get to experience all that Syracuse, New York has to offer. Eating and nightlife at Armory Square. You can visit the Gilded Club, which was actually founded by Whitman alumni. And there's also opportunities to engage in the communities around Syracuse and around the globe with the Whitman Challenge and Residency Program. Could you give us just one line to sum up your Whitman experience so we can wrap up this video? Amazing. <laughs> Love it. So whatever it is you want to do, whether it's to become a bold leader, an innovator, advance your career, or anything in between, you belong here. Be Whitman, be Orange. Hey, so I think that gives you a little bit about why you should be at Whitman. And I think I just closed the wrong screen. No, hang on just a moment. Okay. All right. So moving on to the specializations that we offer at the Whitman School of Management, these are our traditional specializations, uh, all the ones that are indicated with an asterisk here, both for the MS specialization, as well as the MBA specialization, they are STEM designated programs. And we can talk about this in the Q&A section if anybody has questions about it. So very briefly about the full-time MBA program, it's a traditional two-year degree program that requires 54 credits to complete of which you have 36 core credits and 18 specialization credits. And here in the right column, you have all the specializations that you can take in order to complete those 18 credits. Nine credits from up to other uh, 
graduate programs are allowed as long as these are on campus. So I can give you an example, for instance, if someone comes with an engineering background and would like to take some courses from engineering, you are allowed to take up to nine credits as long as they are approved by your academic advisor and they are also approved by the engineering department to be open to people outside of their program, right? Then there are some other opportunities, uh, and I've mentioned a couple over here for a Singapore internship and the residencies. Again, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the MBA here because I understand today's uh, demographic is possibly more focused on the MS programs. So these are our MS program specializations, except for business analytics, which requires 36 credits to complete. All other programs require 30 credits. Uh, there is flexibility in completion, and what I mean is that the duration of the program is decided upon by the student. So you have the opportunity to complete the program for any of the MS programs outside of business analytics. Typically, time completion is either nine months, which is one year, not counting the summer months, or you can complete 16 months with an internship, so it would be a, a year and a half or you could go up to 21 months, which is take two years um, and not do the summer internship. So the choice is yours, whether you want to do an internship for credit or not. For business analytics, the choice is a little different because it's 36 credits. So it's either 16 months with an internship or 16 months without an internship or 21 months without an internship, right? So you don't have to get worried about it at this stage because when you come into the program, you will have an academic advisor who will help you build your program of study. And so you will work with them to go over your interests and how you would like to plan out your program. And they will guide you in um, picking the right courses that you have to complete, which are part of your required core and what electives you might be allowed to take in any of these specializations. Again, the specializations are here on the right side. Um, the one thing I do want to highlight is this year for fall 23, we are test optional for the GMAT or GRE. This means that the test is recommended, but it is not required. And so those of you who might be interested in still taking the test, even though we are test optional, you are welcome to take the test. And the score will be um, taken into consideration when you submit your official score reports. So let's talk a little bit about preparing the application because I just wanted to touch upon a few things about the program and then touch upon some best practices with the application and then just open it up for questions because I want to hear from you and answer whatever might be useful for your purposes as you navigate this trajectory. It's an online application. There is one application essay irrespective of the program that you are applying for. It's about 750 words. The video component, this is only required for MS applicants. And the main purpose for this is that there are three questions that you can answer via video. You can record yourself. Nobody will be interviewing you from the other side. Um, you just turn on the video. You have five minutes to record your responses. And this is just another way for you to demonstrate your interest in the program, as opposed to writing multiple essays, right? So utilize it well and um, demonstrate not just your interest in the program, but also your verbal competency, your you know, language fluency, if you are not a native speaker of uh, English. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself over here. We need two layers of recommendation. Please keep in mind that the application portal will give you the opportunity to upload three letters, but for review purposes, we only require two. So the two first letters that we receive on a first come first serve basis, we will accept those two and we will um, move your application for review to the committee. The official score reports, again, they are test optional for the MS programs, but if you do decide to send us the score reports for your GMAT or GRE, then we will require the official score reports. For English proficiency tests, they are waived for Nigerian citizens and other African countries where uh, you might be native speakers of English and certain places in the Caribbean um, and of course other English native speaking countries. But for all the others, we do require um, an English proficiency score. The reason why this is specifically stated here is I think the last webinar um, 
that this presentation is for was specific to Nigeria. So the second round application deadline is on March 15. So we are uh, coming up towards it, but don't wait until March 15th in order to submit your application. If you are ready to submit and have all your documents ready, you can submit sooner than that, okay? So a little bit about application preparation. When I have, when I get a lot of emails from students, one of the things that I notice is that there, there's a lot of anxiety about what is the actual formula to prepare the application. So just note that there is no formula. Um, I've just shared with you in the previous screen the basic application requirements, the components of the application, but then what you want to focus on is how well are you presenting your candidacy. So if you want to take time to prepare and present a compelling candidacy, then take the time, invest the time, don't be in a rush to submit it within one or two days um, of getting to know about the program but take some time to prepare your application, present a compelling candidacy rather than a rushed one. Incomplete applications will only delay the review process. So when we say incomplete applications, anything that is on this list that is missing, even if it means that your letter of recommendation hasn't come in time or your official score report has not been received, it will be considered that your application is incomplete and therefore it will only delay the review. For the application essay, this is something that I've seen generates a lot of anxiety, which is not needed. The purpose of having the essay prompt uh, is not to generate anxiety, but to actually assist you in preparing your application. There is a question prompt. So utilize the question prompt to respond to the question. Don't write a generic statement of purpose. That does not help you. Do not write a personal statement. That does not help you. Write a response that answers the question. Um, you can reference the website. You can reference this webinar if you find it helpful. You can reference conversations with Whitman current students or uh, alumni or any content that you have seen in other places, um, whether you see it in um, any other presentations or you've attended any of our events. Um, you can reference any of that and then say how that has helped you, you know, uh, understand more about the program or about the school uh, or about student life. And that's why you wanted to apply. It's not a negative at all if you reference different things from the website. In fact, it just shows us that you are interested in the school and interested in wanting to learn more. And you're also telling us what's working and what's not working. Because sometimes we run all these different social media campaigns and other marketing campaigns that not everybody is aware of. And so when someone has come to our website and has submitted an application that actually tells us, oh, wow, what we are doing is actually working. So it's a way of helping us understand um, through informal feedback as well. So do not hesitate to tell us. Um, and don't think that it would be a negative if you reference a current student or a friend who uh, invited you to apply to our program. It's not a negative at all. For letters of recommendation, this is another question that I get very often about how should I pick my recommender? Who should write a letter of recommendation? Should it be the CEO of the company where I'm working? Should it be somebody, um, should my professor write it on an official letterhead? So choose your recommenders carefully. They have to be people who have seen you in some capacity. Either it's a professor from whom you are getting a letter because you are a recent graduate and you've taken their course or you've worked closely with them on a research project or um, an assignment, whatever it might be. But if you've graduated five years ago, 10 years ago, getting a letter from your faculty member from when you attended college is not going to help you, right? So choose your recommender carefully. Give them enough time to prepare your letter. So. Keep in mind that everybody has their own life and responsibilities, and then they're taking on additional by accepting to write you a letter. For instance, if it's a faculty member and they have 50 students in their class and about 30 of them are applying to different universities, think about how many letters they have to write, right? So you want to give them maybe your resume, try to find some time to meet with them if possible, 10, 15 minutes just to update them on what it is you are seeking, 
to give them an idea of how to write your letter and then just you know give them a heads up of when the deadline is approaching and um, request that they give themselves enough time to be able to make the deadline right financial documents this is the other thing that is one of the prime um, reasons for why your uh, application, I'm sorry, why your admissions offer might be delayed. So if possible, submit along with the application. To make an admissions decision, we do not need to see your financial documents. This is more for processing your I-20 paperwork, especially for international students, because the uh, paperwork cannot be provided until and unless your financial documents have been Approved. This could change in coming months or in future, but as of now, this is the policy. So in order to avoid further delays, if you are able to submit your paperwork ahead of time, please do so. Important information, scholarship and application fees. So our application fee is actually on the lower side compared to most other schools. We charge $75 per application, but I am willing to offer you application fee waiver codes and I will share in um, the next few screens on how you can request an application fee waiver code. With respect to scholarship, we offer merit scholarships from the school. They're considered for all applicants, irrespective of the program that you are applying for. There is no separate application. There is no separate application deadline, no other additional uh, essays or additional documentation that you have to send in order to request the scholarship. In fact, you don't even have to request a scholarship because it is automatic consideration. It's based on the same admissions criteria. So everything that you submit with this within this application checklist, all of these materials will be taken together to also decide upon your scholarship information. There might be some cases where we could request an admissions interview on a case-by-case -case basis, but this is not mandatory. So again, over 90% of accepted students are awarded a scholarship and how much will depend on your individual candidacy. So you and your best friend could have studied together from elementary school all the way through college, finished college, you could be working as colleagues but you might end up getting different scholarship. Don't write in and ask, why did I get X amount and why did my friend get Y amount? Um, it will not be disclosed. There is obviously something different about each of you that has uh, resulted in the different outcome. So you want to know that you should present the best candidacy for you as opposed to trying to compare yourself with the crowd or with, uh, you know, with your close friends who might be applying alongside you, okay? So how to request a fee waiver code? This is how you want to request it. You are eligible to request a code because you attended this webinar, but the code will not be sent automatically. I need an email referencing this webinar title and date and indicate your program of interest. If I don't have a program of interest, my colleague will not know where to input you in the system. And so that will delay sending you a code. So again, it's not mandatory that you have to request the code right after this meeting or right after this uh, info session. You can apply, uh, use the code to apply for the March 15 deadline, or you could also utilize it to apply for the last round deadline, which is April 15, as long as you are applying for fall 2023. If you are, for whatever reason, thinking of about applying for fall 24, then you would have to contact me later in the year to get a different code. The codes that we have right now are only for fall 23. Okay. I thought I would put in some pictures because otherwise the presentation becomes pretty dry. So this here in the top left corner is our mascot, Otto. And of course, as you can see from these hats up here, this is during convocation. This building on in the bottom left is our um, School of Music, um, which some of us refer to as the Hogwarts building on campus. And of course, for those of you interested in games, here is a view of the uh, dome and, and, and our stadium. And this is another gorgeous 
So like I said, you know, it's a gorgeous, beautiful campus, um, irrespective of which season you take pictures in and walk around. There's a lot of uh, greenery, a lot of spaces for you to hang out and uh, look at stuff. So let's open it up for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing and there we go. Thank you so much, Shri. Thank you so much for the presentation. And of course, I want to thank all the uh, participants who are with us today. Of course, if you have any questions concerning the master programs, the MBA tracks, feel free to ask away. We are here to help you and hopefully to give you some more insight into uh, what student life um, at Syracuse is like. So we do have some questions and I would like to start by a participant asking about the industry partnerships. So the Syracuse offer any uh, partnerships for working, I assume, while studying? So working while studying, this is always a, an interesting question because we have to take into account um, visa regulations in, in place over here. So keep in mind that we are a US university. So you will be attending school as a uh, student on a student visa, which is the F1 student visa. As a student at a US university, international students are only allowed to work for 20 hours a week on campus. So you are allowed to secure a job on campus, anywhere on campus, um, irrespective of the department. There is no stipulation that it has to be connected to your program of study when it's an on-campus job um, that you can acquire for 20 hours a week. Not everybody is eligible to receive a student assistantship, so students take up different types of jobs. I've had students work at the student cafeteria. I've had them work at the library. Uh, there are those who work at uh, a completely different school while they are getting their degree at the Whitman School of Management, and then they might be working at, I don't know, communication school in their tech department. So it doesn't matter where you are employed as long as it is on campus. With respect to getting opportunities to work outside of campus, that would be by pursuing an internship in the summer. So again, student visa regulations require that you attend school for at least one year before you become eligible to take up a job off campus. So the Whitman Career Center can assist you in finding those internships and can assist you with resources to apply for the internships uh, while you are pursuing the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sri. So to move to the next question, a participant is asking if you actually double check the references in their letters of recommendation. Well, now that you're pointing it out, maybe I should start doing extra. <laughs> I should pay extra attention to that. Uh, there is a certain level of scrutiny that does go into it. It's not to say that, you know, there is no way to find out whether the letters that we have received are genuine or not. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to state this or not, but there there is a case, for instance, I will say recently of... Um, a candidate got denied because their letters were plagiarized. And um, it might seem incredible that somebody would do that, but for whatever reason it, it happened, whether it was out of ignorance, whether it was out of um, some kind of uh, an oversight uh, that happened, I, we don't know, so not blaming anybody here, but just stating the fact that yes, that can get you denied. So you want to find a recommender. Um, and in here, I wanna take a moment to explain why we look at the letters of recommendation, because I think that piece is always forgotten or not really understood by uh, applicants. So the purpose of requesting a letter of recommendation is not to try and put the candidate in a spot, but rather to try and form a complete picture about the candidate from multiple sources. Keep in mind, we're trying to get a dynamic picture about the candidate based on static info, which is paper. We have transcripts, which are measurable um, numbers about your abilities. We have test scores, if you submit them, again, which is measurable content about your abilities. 
the essay is something that the candidate has written, one hopes, by themselves, explaining about their interest and what it is they want to pursue. That's what we're trying to understand. So to help triangulate and complete the picture, we're trying to ask the candidate, find the people that you are comfortable, who know you really well, and you think will present a good picture about you in helping a complete stranger, which is an admissions rep, understand why you will do well in our program. When you utilize it that way, now suddenly you want to find not the quickest person who writes you a letter, but the person who's going to present your candidacy in the best light possible. And I think that piece is usually not explained to candidates, and also um, there might be the sense that candidates think this is yet another piece of the application I have to get done. And so there is anxiety around it, but I want to sort of dispel that anxiety and say it's utilized in a way to present a picture about you because something that is not there in the measurable content, like let's say you graduated seven years ago from your undergraduate institution and you didn't have a great GPA. But then in the seven years you've been working and your supervisor has a glowing letter of recommendation about your abilities. That actually helps your case. And so think about it in that sense and uh, take some extra time to try and find your recommenders and really work with them to help them present a positive side about you. Sure. Long-winded answer to a very short question. <laughs> But it was very insightful and actually one additional point, if I may, is that sometimes people are too modest and maybe someone else who knows you really well and who knows your strengths and your uh, skills can highlight them better than you would because you absolutely. would rather go with absolute mo modesty than, you know, uh, make it worth uh, the reader's while and actually put yourself out there. So yeah. thank you so much for, for the insight tree. Um, so to move to the uh, next questions, uh, a participant is asking, what are the most common jobs students can expect to land after graduating? They didn't specify if from an MSc or an MBA, so I'm going to ask you if you can offer some examples. Uh, it really all. depends on the specialization that you choose, whether it's an MS degree or an MBA degree, right? If you're like if you're if you're studying the degree or specialization in business analytics, then obviously the the type of positions that you're going to be shooting for are potentially as a business analyst. And so what type of industry you go into really depends on your choice of interest. I've had people go into healthcare. I've got I have I'm just thinking of uh, an Italian uh, student, an alumna. She graduated with her uh, MBA in uh, marketing and business analytics, and she went into a healthcare related company, but into their marketing analytics type of a role, right? So the industry is possibly, it's a marketing firm that's possibly focused on healthcare related content, but she's still essentially doing marketing and analytics. So coming out of her MBA, even though she didn't have a healthcare background. Yeah. So, so I want to uh, stress again, the importance of recognizing and understanding the specialization uh, and not viewing it in terms of just a degree uh, for the academic part and not viewing a job based on just this title. Right. Even even in in uh, if you if you were to take uh, my own example, I'm assistant director. OK, what does assistant director in the finance industry mean as opposed to in education, as opposed to in consulting? Right. So it depends on the industry. So without the context, it means nothing. The title taken by itself doesn't mean anything. And then uh, people get surprised. But the work that you're doing could be very similar to that of an educational consultant. I was like, yes, but that's not what I'm called. Because in this industry, in this university, this is the title, right? So always look at the responsibility. And I always like to stress about job functionality as opposed to designation. So that might be something for people to think about. But to answer, you know, much more specifically, because I think sometimes students want like direct answers. So we've had people go into fields like consulting. We've had them go into 
marketing roles, digital marketing, um, into product management, into, uh, and then as you grow in the company, depending on how you're situated, then your titles will change accordingly as well, but then your overall emphasis will be based on the specialization that you choose. Thank you so much, Sri, for uh, for the thoughtful response. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, industry is something that's very relative. I'm going to agree on this, and I myself am not in the line of job that one would, would expect for an international relations student, yeah. but you never know where life takes you. So yes. I agree on, on that. So to move to the next question, a participant is asking if um, you offer any scholarships to help with funding. Yes, so as I had shared earlier, over 90% of the uh, candidates who apply to the program will receive a scholarship award. We consider merit scholarships. We offer merit scholarships. We don't have any specific funding for female students or for students from a particular region. We consider um, merit scholarship across the board for all candidates, irrespective of whether you're domestic candidates or international candidates. And as of now, that's what we are able to offer. So the possibility of receiving full scholarship is very, very rare and is definitely not possible for MS uh, programs because they are shorter duration programs. And so you, your compelling candidacy will get you the max that you can get, but it will still be a partial scholarship. So I would encourage people to explore other possibilities to stack on with our scholarship and also keep in mind that our scholarship can only be utilized for tuition and fees. It cannot be used for living expenses. It'll be used to us to cover your credit for your courses. Thank you, Shri. So I see a participant has their hand raised. So unfortunately, we cannot open your mics. But if you do have any questions you would like to ask, please write in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we'll be happy to take your questions. And to move to the questions that we already have, uh, a participant from Italy is asking, how much uh, does a master's degree amount to? Um, okay, so conversion into euros is tag your it, Slovenia, your job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, but typically for um, Syracuse University, because we are a private university, we charge tuition per credit. And I think this might be a good time to actually show the space on the new website where one can um, find this information. So I'm just going to use marketing as an example for the program. And I'm going to share my screen again so that whoever wants to, you know, see this, they can. So this is our new website. Uh, so you click on this and you can go to undergraduate or graduate. So I'm on the graduate page and I've chosen MS and marketing. So as you scroll down, one of the things that you have is right here, costs and financial aid. So you don't even have to go down all the way to all of this, but you can. But here is cost again, 1802 per credit. It is a cost breakdown. So you can go here or you can go up here and potentially go into this. There are program costs, and this is what you would want to look at for international graduate students. This gets updated every summer. So the bursar's office will update the page for um, the credit for tuition. Um, I'm sorry, tuition per credit. And so as you scroll down, this is for undergraduate. Then you scroll down further, you will see graduate tuition right there. So keep in mind, this is graduate cost of attendance for 22, 23 academic year. So which means in summer of 23, this will change for 23, 24 academic year. The one thing I will highlight here um, is this little asterisk right after tuition. Pay attention to that because this is based, this amount is based on 18 credit hours for the academic year. So if you're doing a 30 credit program, for example, MS and marketing, which is the page we are you know, currently exploring, MS and marketing is a 30 credit program. 
So if you are doing 18 credits in the first year and then uh, 12 credits in the second semester, I'm sorry, third semester, like as a 16 month program, you can break it down that way. If you do 21 month program, then you want to calculate um, nine credits per semester. So this gives you an idea, okay, for 18 credits per year. If it's a business analytics program, then you want to remember the total is 36 credits. So you want to calculate accordingly, all right? So I just wanted to point, to point that out. And then these are some breakdowns for food and housing and personal expenses. Health insurance, of course, is mandatory, but the amount over here, the indirect expenses might vary. But for the purposes of the I-20, this is the amount you would have to demonstrate. So the, the amount total cost of attendance is listed over here and minus your scholarship for tuition, that's what you would deduct and you can calculate the rest of your amount right here. So roughly about like, you know, 56, if it's a 30 credit program, I wanna say, and if it's 36 credits, then tag on another um, 6,000 maybe. So about 62. So that's what you would end up with. Uh, approximately. Thank you so much, Sri. So I hope that was insightful for all, all participants. And I was wondering if we can maybe share uh, a link to all programs, Sri, just so that participants can uh, hopefully mm -hmm. browse more after we are done with this event. But of course, I, I would like to also um, let everyone know that they will get um, an email after this event with the recording. And of course, also with all the brochures, and if you are inter interested in any master's or MBA track at Syracuse, uh, you are uh, more than welcome to, to get in touch with uh, which three here. Uh, so one participant is asking if we can maybe also dive in into the uh, expenses. Uh, so what kind of expenses can students expect to run into while studying um, at Syracuse, aside from the tuition fee? Oh, what type of expenses? When you go to a new country, shopping always becomes an expense, doesn't it? <laughs> you want to, and and not even not even just when you're um, in a new country. I have to say, I don't know if I should say this on uh, camera, but well, fine, I'll say it. I'm I'm. Uh, uh, um, you know, I'm an offender as well. Last night, as I was preparing this presentation and going over stuff, I found myself browsing and I was looking at an online shopping site and, you know, just to release the stress a little bit and browsing for stuff. So it gets very easy for you to sort of get lost in when you're a new student coming into a new country. It's very easy to sort of get lost in exploring online shopping and doing different things. And especially if you are on campus, there is the bookstore, which is very, very uh, distracting, I should say, in a good way, but also very expensive on your wallet. So be mindful of that, because if you are a sports fan, if you are a school fan, then you want to buy everything that represents a school. Right. So that could be one thing, which is these, these are all miscellaneous personal expenses that I'm highlighting first, because um, this, I think, is the thing that we don't necessarily have so much control over. Give into our impulses. Right. And marketers know this. So they put stuff in your face where you can see it and then you get attracted and then, you know, so, so that's something you want to be mindful of. Of course, one of the things you want to keep in mind, like I showed you pictures of the weather. So when you do come here, this is a necessary expense, right? So not frivolous, but necessary expenses would be to prepare for the weather. So it does get pretty cold in Syracuse. Right now, I might be sitting in a looking very comfortable, but it's actually snowing outside. So if I'm going outside, it's below, um, below zero degree centigrade. Currently, it's in the negative. Um, so you want to be appropriately dressed so you don't get frostbite. Uh, the temperature is controlled in the buildings. So of course you are safe in the buildings where there is heat, but when you're walking outside, so you want to be mindful of being dressed in layers. You have a good jacket, you have good shoes, you have you know protective gear for your gloves, hat, scarf, all of those things. These are necessary expenses. 
outside of these, you might have um, an opportunity, for instance, to visit, let's say, New York City or the West Coast, um, where as part of the school's efforts in, uh, in collaborating with our alumni and certain companies, uh, and this ties into the earlier question about industry partnerships, where we bring our students to these locations to meet with recruiters or to meet with alumni and understand what the experience is all about and introduce you to the HR uh, folks at these companies as well, is like you might encounter these trips, which happen um, on a semester basis. Sometimes they are, we just completed the first one to uh, Silicon Valley. So it's a new venture. So there might be some new opportunities like that for which you would have to cough up some you know, money from your personal side. The school might be able to offer some assistance, but will not be able to absorb the whole cost because we're looking at like 20, 30 students going on these trips. So you want to prepare for something like that, which is an opportunity to enhance your own profile and for your own professional development. So those are some things. The one thing I did not mention um, is something called the WIRE initiative, which is the Whitman Industry Readiness uh, Experience. And this is uh, like a scholarship, but it's not a scholarship that is tagged on to your um, admission. This is something after you become a Whitman student, and let's say you want to earn a certification and there is an expense attached to earning that certification that you can apply for the WIRE scholarship to request funding. For example, if you are a supply chain student and you want to uh, earn the APEX certification, there is a cost attached to it, but you know that having will enhance your profile when you go into the job market. So to apply for the APIC certification, you want to request a WIRE scholarship and say, I'm preparing to take the exam at such and such semester. So I would like the scholarship in order to pay for this exam and take the exam. And then once you take the exam and then you, you know, show us a, the proof that you actually took it and, and also set up the exam date. And so the, the, the committee will review the need for that scholarship and understand why that having that certification is beneficial for you and will cover the funds that are needed for that. So that's an expense that if we did not offer that scholarship, you would be paying out of pocket. Sometimes it can get pretty pricey. It could be a thousand dollars. It could be fifteen hundred dollars. So that's something that the school will help you with. So there might be some expenses like this that come into play. Uh, which are necessary expenses, but which are also serious expenses that you want to keep in mind. Outside of that, um, I would say everybody should just practice being healthy because you don't want to get sick. <laughs> if you get sick, again, you are going to be incurring expenses which you, uh, which you could potentially avoid by focusing on your own health. And there are ways to engage in that you know, there's opportunity for students as part of your tuition to go and access the barn center, which has the gyms, which has like a lot of other, um, you know, depending on like sports. Um, also, like there is uh, there are swimming pools. I cannot swim, so I cannot tell you about the swimming pools, but I'm sure there are those of you who can and you would benefit from utilizing the pools. They are heated pools, by the way. They're not, they're not, we're not throwing you in cold water in cold weather. So I, I'm pretty sure it's very <laughs> relaxing. And so you can take advantage of that. And so there are opportunities in different ways for you to um, focus on mind, body, and soul, if you will while pursuing your academics. And I hope you will consider it as a full package experience. Thank you so much, Sri. Uh, so for all of you, you can practice being healthy um, at Syracuse <laughs> and hopefully you will stay that way. Um, so we have one last question, Sri, and a participant is asking if uh, the courses include any projects or a teamwork on real case mm -hmm. studies. Yes is all based on real case studies. And in some cases, you will have actual experiential learning opportunities outside of the class also. 
wherein a local business might be, you know, requesting some assistance and a faculty member might um, bring in the business into the classroom and then have people work in teams on solving that business problem. So it's, it's always the idea being that rather than waiting for you to finish up your education and then go into the real world to experience a real world business challenge, the curriculum is designed to give you that opportunity while you are in the program so that you can engage in solving or at least attempting to solve a real world business problem while you are learning the concepts that are related to it. So yes, you will have opportunities for that. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, so I don't see any more questions for the moment being, and I do want to stress out for our participants that if they have any, any other questions, we are happy to take them. Um, and if not, you can request your certificate of attendance by Doc City uh, by popping an email to the email address I just sent you. And Shri, I was wondering if you have anything, uh, anything else, any other topic that you would like to focus on before we wrap this event, perhaps any um, advice on how prospective applicants may tailor their application? Have you seen any common mistakes in terms of applying? Yeah, one of, uh... One of many uh, errors is carelessness, right? And a uh, tendency to be too quick. And, and, and this, is, this is something that all of us are guilty of, like irrespective of whether we are a student or not, like we try to, we just wanna get it done and get it off our plate. So I would say just take a moment um, because proofing errors will cost you tremendously in certain scenarios you make a little error Lavinia and I are communicating I'm pretty sure I've done typos and errors in my messages when I'm quickly typing on the phone but she's not going to ding me on it for that response or not responding to my message but if you do that in an application it could cost you admission right so the context is different so I would say take some time for proofing errors all of us admissions reps are, are aware that you're probably researching multiple schools as you should. Do not make the mistake of copying and pasting your responses from one application to another without changing and tailoring it to the particular school that you are applying for, right? So those are some things. And then grammatical errors, of course, like yes, while there are allowances that we make that it may, English may not be your first language. We want to at least see that you have the level of competency that you need to be in a master's program, which is going to be pretty rigorous academically, right? So make sure you present your candidacy. All of these things matter in saying when you present your candidacy, because you want to come across as a motivated student who is really interested in pursuing the advanced degree because you see value in it not just because eh well i thought i would get a free application fee waiver code so sure i'll submit an application don't do that <laughs> it's it's costing you time right so invest in yourself and then spend some time trying to present the best candidacy for yourself for sure. Thank you so much, Sri, once again for the presentation, for all the insight, and for taking the time to answer all of the questions that came through. And to our participants, for those of you who stuck with us till the end, thank you so much for being here with us today mm -hmm. or tonight, according to where you are connecting from. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, you will get an email with the uh, re recording of this event and with all the information to get in touch with Syracuse. Uh, universities with my school of management and until next time i hope that everyone uh, will be safe and hopefully see you soon for the next event in partnership with syracuse thank you so yep. much thank you very much everybody and good to see you again all right bye-bye likewise bye-bye